Hi, everyone. Welcome to LDI's virtual seminar series. We're pleased to host today's seminar, which is recognizing and addressing the effects of structural racism on health. Um, just as a brief introduction, as a society, we have a long history of failing to see structural racism and failing to address the many ways in which it impacts daily life of, the, of many people in this country. But the truth, I think, that we all know is that structural racism is embedded in all aspects of society and has had profound impacts on everything we do. So today, we brought together a group of scholars who have critically examined the role of structural racism, specifically on health and health care. And so I'm very pleased to welcome them today. So we have Courtney Bowen, who is an assistant professor and Axelrod faculty fellow in the Department of Sociology and the Graduate Group of Demography at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on social determinants of population health inequality. Uh, Sarah Jacoby is an assistant professor in Penn Nursing, a senior scholar at the Penn Injury Science Center, and a former trauma nurse. Her work examines the intersection of injury risks and outcomes with the social and built conditions of ur urban environments. Also joining us is Jamila Michener, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Government and Cornell, at Cornell University and co-director of the Cornell Center for Health Equity. Her research focuses on poverty, racial inequality, and public policy in the U.S. John Rich is also joining us, who is a professor of health management and policy at Drexel University and director of the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice. His work focuses on developing models of care across public health, education, social service, and justice systems for African-American men in urban settings. And then today's session will be moderated uh, by Penn's Athene Venkatramani, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy here at Penn. He's a general internist and a health economist, and he is also the director of the Penn Opportunity Health Lab, which studies the life course origins of health and socioeconomic inequality. So with that, I will hand over the reins to Athene. Great, thanks Rachel, uh, and thanks to all the panelists for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you all. We're gonna cover a lot, um, really discussing the entrenched and insidious problem that is structural racism, uh, how structural racism is embedded uh, in our daily interactions all the way from interpersonal interactions up to our policies, and hopefully we can end on what we can do about this going forward. Um, so Professor Bowen, I'd like to start with you, uh, really to set the stage. So you've done a lot of work recently on the relationship between race, uh, wealth, and health. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that informs us uh, about structural racism and its various insidious impacts on health? Sure, thanks for the question. So one of the most well-documented associations, I think, in social science and in public health is this link between socioeconomic status and health where in general we see increases in material resources like income or increases in education being associated with improved health outcomes. And wealth is arguably a really important dimension of socioeconomic well-being, perhaps less studied than some of the other domains of socioeconomic status. But when scholars include measures of, health, of wealth in studies of population health, typically what they do, it's a, it's a measure of a family's net worth or a household's net worth. That is a sum of all their assets, net of any debts. And, you know, in my own work and others have found that wealth is really critical for health as people age. It can cushion families from the economic hardships brought on by illness or job loss and um, allow families to continue paying bills even when wages are suspended. It improves um, individuals' well-being even after they exit the paid labor market. And, you know, the other important dimension of wealth is that it's really a status attainment process whereby individuals and families accumulate assets as they age and then pass on those assets and class status to future descendants. And this is really a key dimension of why it is so useful um, in, the, in informing studies of population health and the, the links between racism and health because racial wealth inequality in the United States is just staggering. So estimates suggest that families in the U.S. own anywhere between five and nine cents for every dollar 
owned by white families. And really the racial wealth gap is the product of structural racism and institutionalized racism, both historical and more contemporary. So we can think about the racial wealth gap as being the product of a host of historical forces, including um, dating back to the days of slavery, the failures during reconstruction to provide um, 40 acres and a mule to formerly enslaved individuals, the seizure of, of black assets through white violence and terrorism, Jim Crow legacies um, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, right? And so these policies and practices allowed white families in the United States to build tremendous wealth that has been passed on across generations. And we continue to see racial discrimination in credit, lending, and labor markets in ways that continues to exacerbate the racial wealth gap. So, you know, for me, understanding the racial wealth gap as um, a function of structural racism that is both the product of historical and contemporary processes that have excluded Black families from processes of wealth accumulation in ways that pattern population health you know, it improves sort of some of the insights of the institutional and policy mechanisms linking structural racism to population health. The force of history in, in driving some of the outcomes and, and inequalities you're studying is, is so powerful and deep, it strikes me every time. And just the myriad of ways that it can present uh, as a health inequality, I think, has also struck me. And, and that's where I'd like to go to you, Professor Rich. Um, You've written a lot about uh, racial trauma that young black men in particular and, and boys uh, experience after surviving a violent encounter, uh, often because of how they're treated by law enforcement or medical professionals in the healthcare establishment. And you're a primary care physician yourself, and you've seen this um, play out in your clinic and how this trauma can leave these kind of wounds and scars that persist well beyond any kind of physical manifestation of that violence. Um, so I, I'd be curious to hear from you uh, if you could describe how racial trauma arises uh, from structural racism and the ways in which it might affect our health. Well, I would build on what Courtney was talking about in terms of really interrogating the history. So we think about both of these systems, law enforcement and healthcare, as having a deeply embedded history of structural racism. So we know that police forces arose um, out of slave catcher battalions, and it's Bill Bratton, who was the chief of police both um, in New York, talks about this, and in LA. And so we know that that the really the genesis of policing came from returning people who were trying to escape from this brutal system. Uh, we know that for much of the history of the police force, black people were excluded and have been excluded from participation in that system. We know about the fact that the civil rights movement in large part was about police brutality. We think about it in terms of access to a variety of services, but much of it was about that. Um, mass incarceration, over-policing of communities, the empowerment of the police in seizing assets, um, and then more recently, a recognition, almost as though it was an epiphany, that police violence disproportionately affected black and brown people only because it was caught on tape. So the words and the stories of young people or people, black people, were not, um, were not honored. And so in a sense, you've sort of built the machine. Once you've done all this, you've built the machine. So that whatever happens is somewhat irrespective of the the motives or the sensibilities of the people who are running those systems. Similarly, um, medicine. We know that many of the proponents of black inferiority and white supremacy came from medicine. Many of them were uh, honored as leading physicians here in Philadelphia. We know that medicine even in, invented a disease. I just recently learned this from a colleague of mine called drapedomania which was the disease that made slaves want to escape from slavery. And so the treatment was more brutality. It was actually pathologized. Freedom was pathologized for black people. And we know there were segregated hospitals, segregated training, 
the Flexner Report, which is much lauded, actually closed down training opportunities for black people. And so we have these incredible disparities. So again, you've built the machine. And it is no surprise then that these systems carry out this brutality. And particularly when combined with poverty and our, um, our tendency to blame poor people for their situation and, and their pain, when young people come in who are victims of violence, they're often regarded by those who first are supposed to come and help them in the streets and then by healthcare providers as having played a role in their victimization. And so I, I would say that the, the trauma that they carry with them leads them to avoid both systems and to understand and believe deeply that these systems are cooperating with one another. And in some ways they are. I mean, in some ways when someone comes in with a gunshot wound, providers are supposed to call law enforcement. But that racial trauma makes them feel less safe in the world. And their reactions, for example, to law enforcement based on this trauma may actually put them in greater peril. So if you think about it, Freddie Gray ran from the police. That was, that was his crime. He ran from the police. So if you're, if you're a, afraid of the police and you behave in ways that demonstrate that, you actually raise the likelihood that you are going to be involved in that system. Um, and finally, I would say, all of these moments represent transfers of opportunity from black people to white people. So the, the notion in the collective, so to Courtney's point, really, this was about not just uh, cutting black people off from opportunity, but transferring those opportunities to white people. So that, that wealth gap is, is a transfer. So that to the extent that um, as a white person you enjoy, whether you were very much a proponent of, of equality, you enjoyed the benefits of having your house be worth a certain amount, that was partly due to the fact that there was redlining, whether you liked it or not. And so part of our discussion has got to get into the weeds of the history, but also the levels, institutional, personally mediated, internalized, that constitute what we're talking about as structural racism now. Yeah, thank you uh, for that. I think you've actually set up my questions for the next uh, two panelists really nicely. Um, and let's go to this idea of, the, of building the machine. I think that's a very, to me, that was a very powerful metaphor. Um, Professor Mishner, you've studied the machine, uh, how it's built, and the feedback loops between the machine and the people that are uh, that it's serving. Um, so most recently, you looked at the Affordable Care Act, which uh, we're talking about now for different reasons in the news. Um, but you looked at its effects on racial inequalities, uh, particularly the Medicaid expansion, non-discrimination protections, and workforce diversity initiatives. Um, just from that research and in your general experience, can you tell us a little bit about the political process and the policies that arise from that machine? Um, how have they worked in recent years to really either perpetuate or perhaps mitigate um, racial disparities in health outcomes, and as uh, Professor Rich also mentioned, these transfers of opportunity. Now, thank you uh, for the question, and it's been actually really useful hearing what Professor Rich and Professor Bowen have said, and I appreciate the ways that we're sort of building here um, and thinking about some of the really specific, for example, socioeconomic processes um, that are underlying uh, racial racial dis disparities, um, you know, and also sort of thinking across levels in the ways that Professor Rich just pointed out. You know, as a political scientist, the levels that I often focus on revolve around policy and politics. And so the ACA is just one example of a major policy with stark implications um, for racial equality uh, that, that I think holds a lot of lessons for us in terms of the operations of structural racism. And frankly, at the institutional level, often the stealth operations of structural racism. And one of the things that I point out in my work is that, you know, even so folks will hear the kinds of kind of narrative and the evidence that, for example, Professor Rich and Professor Bowen have offered and think like, yeah, that's bad. Uh, but that's history, you know, and, and we're trying to do better now. And we're somehow on this inexorable 
path towards improvement and have gotten or will get to the point where this isn't a problem anymore. Look, we've had a black president and, and there can be this narrative of improvement and this assumption that underlying that narrative, um, our actual, you know, policy um, and political efforts that kind of reflect that narrative of improvement. And I think the ACA really belies that assumption. You know, on its surface, the Affordable Care Act uh, is very much an effort that's about a push towards um, racial equity, at the very least decreasing racial inequities. And if you read the text of the Affordable Care Act, which is quite a quite a bear, but if you look through the text again and again, disparities, uh, race, ethnicity, that language is invoked. And it's certainly um, at the heart of, of what the sort of goal of the Affordable Care Act is, is, is to address those issues. But part of what I point out in my work is where the gap between um, that policy goal and, and actual realities, right? Because we know what the reality of the Affordable Care Act has been, and it's not that the Affordable Care Act is this terrible thing that has done great harm. No, much to the contrary. Um, for many people, it's been a vast improvement over what the status quo was previously, right? Um, and that's worth acknowledging. But at the same time, we know that the improvements that we began to see um, under the kind of umbrella of the affordable, the policy umbrella of the Affordable Care Act, stalled out, have stalled out, right? Specifically with respect to to racial health disparities. And so the policy had a goal. Um, that goal didn't translate into health outcomes in the ways that we might have hoped or wanted. What happened? And part of the explanation of what happened is essentially an explanation that revolves around structural racism on the kind of political level, on the level of politics. And politics undermined the goals of the, of the ACA as a policy. And that happened in a bunch of different ways. Uh, one example I use is is the Medicaid expansion, because Medicaid is what I spend a lot of my time thinking about. Medicaid expansion has been a deeply racialized political process, right? We know that the states that have been most reluctant to expand Medicaid, many of them um, in the southeast, have also been states that have the highest proportion of black uh, state residents, people in the population, and also Latinx, right? But they also have many of those states really high proportions of Medicaid beneficiaries themselves, even higher than what's represented in the state populations who are Black and Latinx. So in the very places where Medicaid expansion is going to vastly disproportionately benefit the health and well-being of people of color, those are the places fighting tooth and nail to make sure that it doesn't happen, right? And on top of that, when we look at, for example, analyses of what drove Medicaid expansion decisions, what the politics is that drove those decisions, we find, for example, that white public opinion about Medicaid expansion and black public opinion about Medicaid expansion diverge. So when you see these average numbers, people support Medicaid expansion. Look under those numbers and what you find is that overwhelmingly black people support Medicaid expansion and white people on just bare, barely a majority, quite tepidly, and in many states, not even that, right? And what we find further is that you look, if you look at the determinants of actual policy outcomes, it is white public opinion that is strongly connected to whether we actually get expansion. So white folks have different preferences, and those preferences get represented in the political process. So again and again and again at each stage, you see racial, structural racism in terms of who gets represented whose voice gets heard, whose policy preferences are reflected in actual policy outcomes. And the answer is white people, right? Um, and not in a way that is sort of neutral or in a way that is just indifferent, but in a way that means harm for people of color, right? With respect to their health and with respect to their dignity as members of a democratic polity, right? I'll stop there. There's much to say, but I also want to hear what other folks have to say. Thank you, for Professor Missioner, for going into that detail about the Affordable Care Act and these political feedback loops. Uh, I think that addresses some of what um, Professor Bowen and Professor Rich had raised um, about the machine. Um, and the other points that you all raised uh, are about history. And that's where I'd like to talk to uh, Professor Jacoby. Um, so, Professor Jacoby, you're a former trauma nurse, and so you've seen a lot of the psychological and physical sequelae of urban violence on young black men firsthand. Um, you've also done research on this, and in doing so, you've taken this really interesting lens of trying to think about the historical drivers uh, of the violence that leads to these poor health outcomes, um, and the violence itself being a poor health outcome. 
So I was curious if you could talk to us about the interaction of um, intergenerational social and economic exclusion, concentrated disadvantage, and the way it plays out in health disparities, particularly uh, in trauma. Let me start by by situating my understanding of considerations for thinking about the perpetuation of violence and disadvantage, whether concentrated or otherwise, in time and importantly, I think, in, in place. I think that the scale and the context of the lens through which we look at violence and specifically interpersonal violence that results in gunshot wounds and its devastating aftermath for individuals, families, and communities is entirely, like the scale is, and the context is so important and history is important. If we think about gun violence to be a disease of people, as I admittedly did when I was working as a trauma nurse in Philadelphia, we can look to understand um, and articulate racial disparities and who is most often injured. In Philadelphia, for example, the relative risk of being injured by a gun assault is about five times higher for black city residents than white city residents. We can also look at endpoints and outcomes of clinical care. So where nationwide epidemiologic studies indicate that black uninsured people are less likely to survive to discharge from an accredited trauma center when compared to any other racial or insurance referent. But if we consider violence a disease of place, and again, using the example of gun violence, we can look to understand and articulate predictors of violence based in socioecologic elements defined through data like the U.S. Census or the American Community Survey. If available, you can use police data on where shootings happen in space and sort of other ways to construct the built and social environmental context bounded by entities like neighborhoods or like, or in order to compare differences based on urbanicity or rurality. But I think when we're talking about structural racism specifically, it's interesting to, or it's important to talk about how it's, how it's in place in urban socioecologies through racial stigma, through intergenerational social uh, economic exclusion and disinvestment. And I think rather than just to overlay dynamics of today's uh, relative segregation of black and brown residents and the burden of exposure of gun violence and gun violence victimization and through a contemporary lens, I think it's also essential that we consider how and why under-resourced places were created, how segregated places were created, and what this all has to do with how we understand people's lives that may now be defined by where they live or their quote unquote high risk for gun violence victimization. You know, so an example of this is I worked with colleagues to look at the city of Philadelphia and explicitly, the explicitly racialized criteria through which federally backed mortgage um, risk was mapped in the 1930s as part of a New Deal era um, economic policy implementation that was aimed at increasing home ownership and stalling urban divestment. And this happened in Philadelphia and cities across the nation in the 1930s. So the highest risk areas were illustrated or for federally backed mortgage were illustrated and mapped um, using the color red, which gives rise to the terminology of redlining. So examination of this, these kinds of maps, I think, gives us an opportunity to consider a spatially explicit, specific artifact or illustration of racist thought and racialization of city space that culminated in economic exclusion about a century ago, and then to look at what's happened since. And so when we overlay today's um, hot spots of gun violence in the city, adjusting for the racial and economic characteristic of city spaces. Like at the time of the map's creation, we found that there was a statistically significant um, level, uh, at a statistically significant level, the same places that were deemed unworthy of investment and racially stigmatized by virtue of its residents, races, and ethnicities, and poverty 100 years ago, those are the same places about five years ago where gun violence and its risks for residents are understood or have become understood as like an everyday feature of the contemporary socio-ecological environment. And I, I think this can be like viewed as a, as a pretty academic exercise. Um, and we don't have, it's true, we don't have opportunity to go back and change historical policy, but I think what it does do is it allows us to understand among who, where, and why investment today might be most justly concentrated. Um, I think we've gotten pretty technically proficient at responding to the physical devastation of trauma, and I think we're beginning to build with more and more evidence opportunities to invest in responses to psychological trauma and trauma-informed care and cross-cutting needs in um, health care and education, employment, and in advocacy and law enforcement interactions. But I think if we think about health effects as a manifestation of the history of people in places and of the product, the emplacement of structural racism, I think we can also think about how to evaluate the resources and the intensity of investment that is sort of commensurate with the damage done. Thank you for that, Sarah. It's um, 
you know, I think we, we've talked a lot now with, with all, all of us uh, about these kind of interweaving historical uh, factors. And I think in the audience, there's been a number of questions of what we do about it. And I promise you, we're going to end there. Um, but before we do, um, I wanted to ask a couple other questions that have come from the audience. Um, one has to do, you know, as part of this national conversation about structural racism, um, not everyone wants to have that conversation. So uh, someone in the audience has raised a good question, which is, um, can you speak to the effects of Executive Order 13950 um, signed at the end of September by President Trump um, that remands uh, federal agencies from holding, quote, divisive un-American instruction on systemic racism? Um, I'm curious if the panelists have any reaction to that um, and what, what, what that kind of response represents and how we might move forward from that. So I'll, I guess I'll start with you, Jamila, um, to get a sense of what you might think. And I, I'd be curious for all of you to weigh in if you can. I was actually just joking with some of my students in my lecture course on uh, on Monday about this, and perhaps I shouldn't have been joking. Perhaps it wasn't a laughing matter. Uh, but I think we've gotten to a point in our politics with executive orders like this that you know either we laugh or we cry, right? Um, it, it, it is an attempt uh, to think that by not talking about racism, by not articulating uh, its uh, underpinnings and its implications and its consequences are not recognizing it that somehow that means that we can move past it or uh, it's not clear to me even from the executive order whether there is um, acknowledgement of the need that there is anything to, to look to move past that if anything I think it speaks to the the importance of our starting assumptions and one of the things that's been clear, even in the conversation that we've had thus far, um, is, for example, among those of us on this panel, I think we share uh, many kind of sh assumptions about a, about an, a number of things. You know, I was just listening to uh, Dr. Jacoby, and much of my work focuses on the role of place. And so I think about Medicaid through the lens of federalism and how the way that Medicaid is structured, it really matters where you live, both in terms of your state, because policies vary so dramatically across states. But even in my book, I, I drill down. It matters what neighborhood you live in, right? The consequences of Medicaid in your life differ, even though the policy is the same based on what neighborhood you live in. And so that's just one example of the many shared um, starting points that we have on this panel. And it means we can engage in a conversation and we can make some headway. Um, not because we all agree with each other on every point and we're just, you know, an, an echo chamber, but because we at least share some basic degree of um, of an understanding that, for example, race, structural racism is real, um, that it matters, that it's operating in in our country and, per, and throughout the world, really, and affecting people's lives profoundly in ways that we must confront. Because we agree on those things, we can have productive engagement about policy changes, about appropriate um, inquiries as scholars, et cetera, et cetera. And what the, an executive order like this does is it says we, we don't have agreement on, on those basics. Um, instead, some of us want to stick our hand, head in the sand and pretend that all is well. Um, and in order to uh, reinforce that game of pretend, you have to stop talking about racism because it doesn't allow me to play this game of pretend. Um, but I think what the what the panelists, what what folks have already said underscores that we don't have the luxury of playing pretend when it comes to talking about naming, articulating racism because people's lives are at stake. Right. Because people are dying every day because of racism. We're in the middle of a pandemic that could not make that any more clear to us. And the kind of stark irony of issuing an executive order like this one in the context of a pandemic that is ravaging black, native and brown communities is it's painful. It's really painful. Um, I'll stop there. I want to actually follow up on that. Um, and maybe, John, I'll direct this to you. Um, or, or to Courtney or Sarah as well. So in this idea of kind of recognizing the problem and having this dialogue, um, a question that's come up is, you know, and, and John, you mentioned this when you, you were speaking as well about the implicit transfer of wealth. But given the institutions that we work at, uh, universities, for example, um, for example, uh, 
you know, Penn is situated in a city where there's deep, deep racial inequalities that Sarah told us about and that, and that, that John uh, faces in clinic. Um, the question is, uh, how can we as university community members um, hold our institutions accountable to a higher standard in kind of addressing the inequality uh, that is around us? So John, I'd like to start with you and then um, we can take it from there. Wow, that's, I think it's a really important question. Um, accountability is, is critical, but conversation is a first step in that direction. So to, to this executive order for a moment, I mean, we have to really think about what that means. In a sense, it deep implication was that um, black people weren't American. It's sort of un-American. If it's un-American to talk about race, then it implies that there's that some of us have achieved and some haven't. And it, you know, it takes me to the, the 1619 Project, which again has been attacked. But one of the fundamental um, epiphanies, I think, that's in that is this idea that it was the struggle of civil rights, um, the struggle of women's rights, the struggles of gay rights that actually helped to realize this dream that the founders had initially articulated, but were essentially had hypocritically um, moved forward as though it were in place. And so in, in many ways, these conversations are more American than anything else because they acknowledge where we are. And within institutions, I think it is critical that we free ourselves up to have these difficult conversations internally, that this is kind of an inside out journey, as our colleague, Dr. Kenneth Hardy says, that in some ways, to try and do at an institutional level, what you're not able to do at an interpersonal level is, is going to be difficult. So I think part of what has happened, to some extent, has been a willingness to begin these conversations, although there's not evenness in how those conversations proceed. And sometimes I think there, there is a sense that, um, Institutions are a little bit out over their skis here because there's a lot of talk about anti-racism. It's just a kind of new term. We haven't, but we have to really struggle with what that means. But ultimately, universities, hospitals, medical centers are anchors in the community. They offer lots of opportunities for jobs. They offer lots of opportunity to impact the local environment economically and policy-wise. And so taking that on, identifying opportunities to enhance the economic well-being of neighborhoods that many of these institutions are situated in is critical, while also creating opportunities for students to attend those institutions in a way that recognizes this transfer of opportunity and pushes away this notion that somehow uh, this is this kind of reverse, this notion of reverse discrimination, which, which though you don't hear that term much, is really implicit in much of what we're hearing, really firmly pushing that aside, even in spite of such targeting as happened to Princeton for uh, the president's comments about historical, you know, racism in that institution and, and suddenly finds um, t targeting by the feds. I think there's a lot of courage that's going to have to be exerted by the leadership of these. Sarah, did, were you going to weigh in there? Or? I would just say that, yeah, that, there, that I'm not sure that there's any point in looking at institutions in an, through an ahistorical lens and, and imagining that this is just a co contemporary phenomenon. I think that as important as it is to think about what could be done, what is the possibility is to look back and see what has been done, how have communities been excluded, how have communities been used um, for labor and for other things in the context of these institutions? How have we even constructed the architecture of our institutions to, to welcome some and to hold others uh, at bay? And, and I think in, in that recognition, I think the possibility for the next step, for the next conversation, regardless of what's happening in, in, at the executive branch level, it is, it is, is wider, it is more potent. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you.
Um, we had, a, you know, we're talking a, about a lot of complex intersecting forces. Um, so we had a question about trying to understand the effects of these different forces and teasing apart the proximal and distal um, mediators, um, the, the as well as the original causal forces, and trying to understand the inequalities we see. So, uh, Courtney, I wanted to ask you, um, and the others again can weigh in about. What are some kinds of best practices for young researchers who are interested in studying the uh, effects of structural racism on health? How do we think, start to think about that when it truly is a very complex problem and one in which measurement is very hard because the systems don't want to, a racist system will not generate measures of its own racism. So um, you've done a lot of work on this, so I wanted to get your thoughts. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think, you know, it builds on some of what's just come out of the conversation about a fundamental misunderstanding on the part of the administration. But I would say also among um, the public more generally about what race is, what racism is, and what evidence of racism looks like. And so I think from the starting place of understanding that racial disparities that we observe in any outcome, whether we're talking about population health outcomes in the pandemic or outside of the pandemic, whether we're talking about racial disparities in wealth or in employment, race disparities in policing and in mass incarceration, these fundamentally arise from structural racism. Without racism, racial disparities in these outcomes would not exist. And so I think starting there as the starting place makes, you know, opens up the world of possibilities in terms of how do we understand this as a complex systems problem um, with, you know, all of the feedback loops that we've discussed operating, right? So it operates both historically and across generations and in the contemporary era, but across all of these systems, housing and wealth and lending, healthcare access, policing, we can observe how they're all intertwined in really critical ways that both reinforce racism and make it really challenging, I think, to pinpoint um, what are the particular leverage points that we can observe and then intervene on. Um, you know, I think from a, from a research perspective or for scholars interested in, in sort of expanding our understanding of how structural racism impacts all of these outcomes, I think there's lots of places for us all, right? And so, you know, one, one way that I've been thinking about it is, you know, research typically focuses on either description, on explanation, and on intervention. And I think these three strands of research are interconnected, obviously. Not all of us can do all three things, but entering research with that as the premise that, you know, rich description informs explanation, explanation informs intervention, and intervention is drawing on all three of these bodies of research, you know, makes it possible for us not to be overwhelmed um, with how um, pervasive racism is and structuring all of these mediating systems and producing all of these um, mutually co-constituted outcomes, but gets us to think about, okay, so how can we as researchers provide new evidence, again, fundamentally understanding that racial disparities in any outcome, in any system, are the result of racism, right? And so it doesn't matter if we can point to racist intent, if we're observing a racist outcome, then we have, in fact, evidence that of racism, right? And so I think for young scholars entering this field of research, to begin with trying to figure out what are some of the questions about what are the institutional mechanisms that we have yet to document, where, where do we need new rich data, where have interventions been theorized but not yet tested or evaluated, there is so many places for us to think think about. Um, I think the key is not getting overwhelmed, um, but looking to senior scholars who have been doing this work, particularly scholars of color who have been engaged in this work for centuries now, to figure out where you your skills and expertise might be best utilized. Thank you, Courtney. I mean, just to reflect on what you said, 
all of all four of you, I have learned a lot from your research, and it's changed the way that I do my own research on this subject. Um, and, and thank you for that really detailed answer. I think it is daunting to enter a space that um, is unnecessarily controversial because we're all trying to help people, um, but and where the causal links are so complex uh, that it can get overwhelming. And that's a really great distillation. Um, I'd like to start moving towards the what do we do about it? Um, structural racism and its consequences on health, because there's a lot of questions on this. Um, I'm going to start with the question um, from Gina South. So she states, um, the white planter slaver class created a wedge between enslaved black people and poor white people to preserve free labor. Uh, so we heard about that for a little bit about that from you, John. Uh, that legacy remains today as we see a racial divide over the support for Medicaid expansion, as you pointed out, Jamila. And the question is, will it be possible to overcome white supremacy to create a cross-racial economic coalition? And that particular question might relate to another question that arose about demographic trends um, in economic inequality uh, and what that might mean for, for uh, uh, structural racism and racial disparities in health outcomes. Um, so that's a big question. Will it be possible to overcome white supremacy to create cross-racial economic coalition? I'll start with you, Jamila, and we'll just go around the table if we can. Yeah, I appreciate this question in large part because I'm a political scientist. So a lot of what I spend most of my time thinking about is the kind of spectrum of political possibilities that will allow for change in the lives of people at the economic and racial margins in this country. So I want to say, yes, it will be possible because any other answer would be deeply nihilistic and would send us all home feeling very sad. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that possible is different than probable and different than easy. Um, and so, yes, possible, but it will not be easy. And, and frankly, what it takes, uh, I think, is building power in communities uh, from the ground up. This is not going to be a top down uh, kind of affair. And that, that's not to say that who's in power at the federal level doesn't matter. It matters. It has consequences for tens of millions of people's lives and well-being. And so it doesn't mean that we should be indifferent to that, right? I mean, we have an election coming up, so let's not be indifferent to, to that scale of politics. But ultimately, I think the kinds of transformational um, change that's going to be necessary, and let me be frank and echo something that Professor Rich said earlier that I thought was so critical. The kind of change that we need is change that involves a significant redistribution of material resources and power. That means that folks who have resources now have to have fewer. They have to have less. And folks who have little to nothing now have to have more. And that's not going to happen because everyone volunteers. It's going to happen through the exercise of power. And so we're going to need transfers of power as well. And Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without demand. It never have, it has, it never will. That continues to be true. And so transformational change will require a shift in power. You only get significant shifts in power with organizing and power building. And for the kinds of shifts that are necessary here, the organizing and power building is gonna have to be among um, folks of color and folks living in or near poverty, the people with the most at stake. And that organizing has to happen explicitly with an eye towards interracial coalition building. It doesn't mean that you're not building power in communities of color um, specifically, but it means that not exclusively, right? There also needs to be power building across racial lines. So that, for example, people living in poverty who are white can recognize and make common cause with people living in poverty who are black or Latinx, People who live living in poverty who are native born can make common cause with folks who are immigrants. And that that kind of cross group um, power building is absolutely critical. And it means that organizations and people um, at the grassroots in specific places. Right. I love that Professor Jacoby pointed us to places that is where power is built on the ground in people's communities around issues that their lives are literally dependent on that they may or may not realize quite yet are deeply political and require their action and their intervention. Um, and so building power is about bringing those people in, about showing them that their engagement matters, that they in fact have power, but it must be wielded and it must be channeled and it must be organized. Um, 
And those folks are going to have to be the key to the, the kinds of change that we need, I think. Not anybody, not any political elite who decides that they deign to offer health care to everyone or what have you. That will only happen when it is demanded from below. Maybe I'll put in a targeted question which came up, uh, which might get to this point of um, transferring power, um, which is the idea of reparations, uh, particularly as someone has asked about uh, Sandy Darity's plan. Um, we could also talk about baby bonds. Um, do, we, uh, do you think uh, that this could be an effective way to deal with um, some racial inequalities? And do you think that, there, that it has a chance to potentially be implemented as a policy? Um, any one of you can take this one. Uh, otherwise, I will call on someone. I'm happy to take a first pass at it. So I, I appreciate this question. Um, given that so much of my own work has focused on the role of racial wealth inequality in the production of racialized health disparities, I've thought a lot about this and um, have been reading Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullins' recent book, From Here to Equality. And I've become fundamentally convinced that reparations as a project is necessary for both acknowledging and redressing the harms and the violence that has stolen black assets and wealth from, from black families for centuries now. And like you know, others have pointed out, this has come at the great advantage of white families. Right. So it's not just that folks, black folks have, have been excluded from these processes of wealth accumulation, but it's been to the advantage of white families across generations. And I think reparations offers both a moral, it's, it's really this moral and economic project. Right? It's acknowledging past harms and offering solutions towards equity. Right. And so when we think about the pervasive nature of institutional racism at multiple levels across history in the current era, right, where we see predatory lending and inclusion, the exclusion of folks from moving to neighborhoods and racial steering, it's impossible for me to think about how we can move towards racial equity without acknowledging and redressing those past harms. And I think the call for reparations is on point. I also, you know, I, um, uh, the Baby Bonds Project is another option that often gets talked about. And I think it has great value in that it is sort of this race neutral um, proposal that um, aims to build wealth among low, in low wealth families in the United States. And for that, it should be lauded. But again, I think that is because it is potentially more politically palpable for folks to swallow a race neutral policy proposal when I think, you know, racism has done racial trauma and racial harm that has been specifically targeted, right? And so we need race specific solutions and acknowledgements and redressing of those problems that I think reparation offer. You know, um, Professor uh, Michener had, had mentioned that you know, reparations isn't going to be something that gets uh, passed quickly through political elites who want to give up wealth, right, or redistribute wealth. But I think, you know, coming from the question of is it possible, I think it is possible, but it's going to be requiring huge mobilization uh, and power building among folks calling for demands for wealth redistribution rather than from political elites sort of making the decision or coming to some epiphany that this might be um, a proposal worth, worth implementing. Thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to get into um, what I think would be a, a, the final topic for us to discuss um, with about nine minutes left here. So, Sarah, I'd like to start with you, and then I would like to go around the room, or this virtual room, rather. And here's how I pose it. What should the next administration do, thinking about the short, medium, and long run, to address structural racism meaningfully uh, and its, uh, the impacts that it has on health thereafter? And each of you has a different way of thinking about this question. So I'm very curious from your uh, disciplinary and research and clinical standpoint what you think the solutions are. So Sarah, I'll start with you. I'm just going to sort of reiterate some of the things that we've been talking about thus far. I think that a conversation about 
what reparations could look like is an essential conversation. And as I think, um, I don't know that I can speak to the entirety of what, you know, the short and long-term goals of the next administration, but I can speak to what might be helpful in the context of healthcare and thinking about how we understand things like the origins of racial disparities in, in, um, in health is that we have to um, really invest in understanding in, in, in not just uh, replicating um, understandings of the fact that there are differences, but under, not understanding the different, uh, understanding the origins of those differences, but also putting just resources. And that can look like a many things that can, that can be from the policy level, but it also can be from the ways we resituate resources, even in, in city government, even in state government, in, in the way that we, um, it's, it's about distribution and it's about recognition of giving the best and the most resources to people who have had it systematically stripped from their lived possibility. And so I, I think that that is the best possible, that is the, that will give us all the better, the best opportunity to, to move in, in ways in which we can think in a, in a very distant future of supporting sort of, 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 an, of an understanding the American dream is one of meritocracy. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, John, uh, what do you think um, about what the next administration can do thinking about the short, medium, and long run to make a meaningful uh, dent in this problem of structural racism? Well, I, I sometimes feel like we can get a little bit, sort of the notion of solving structural racism or fixing it once and for all, I think may overwhelm us because it is it is deeply embedded in racial socialization, the way that we the way that we are are uh, educated, the way that we go through um, the way that families even raise the issue of race or fail to do so, and what that means about racial socialization. But having said that, you know I lean on first a very powerful repudiation of white supremacy and and all of the uh, violence that is now being somehow fueled, I think we need to return to some sense of who we are as a nation. And, and this is somewhat like, in the longer term, what peace and reconciliation looked like for another nation, which is we have to have a, a conversation about who we are and what the what the values are that we adhere to as Americans, and I, all of us are concerned that 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 there are scenarios under which that would not occur. Um, and then fundamentally, I think we have to come to from that understanding some very uh, clear policy imperatives that um, have to be practical, but are based in this redistribution. Uh, many of the terms that we're talking about, reparations, for example, has become highly politically charged because in some ways it's the details of what that looks like. People somehow want to know all of the details, but it's the fundamental idea that we have to reorient the resources that were unfairly robbed from some communities and that that adverse transfer is negatively affecting all of us, that there's some buy-in. I often say to my students in talking about health disparities, it is likely that in the healthcare system and medical care, black people get too little of the resource, the diagnostic or therapeutic resources, and it's likely that white people get too much of them. And either side of that is bad. Um, you don't want more surgery, more medication, more medical care, more um, radiation than you need. Now, that's an extreme example of the ways in which we have to all own into the damage that this does. This is not winner take all as has been um, exemplified. And that new consciousness needs someone in leadership who can um, really own it and needs a kind of the building power, um, as Professor Mission has already talked about, building power from communities, the the kind of understanding um, that Professor Bowen's already talked about, about that this is really about making sure that these resources um, get to the communities that they need. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, 
Jamila, same question to you. Yeah, uh, I will just um, say a few short things, mindful of time. You know, I, I like the time horizon in, in the question. So in the short term and in the long term, I think it's, it's helpful to think about time horizons when we're thinking about change. In the short term, we can think very practically what can be achieved. Um, and that might shape our, our decisions, for example, around voting, right? Or around engaging politically with a political campaign or what have you. So how, how can we get in office folks who are going to protect at least what we have, at least the status quo, uh, which is insufficient, but is nonetheless uh, saving lives relative to what it was before. And so that those are short term decisions about who do we need in office, given the, the past, the political realities right now. How can we operate within those realities to achieve as much as possible for folks who are otherwise vulnerable and marginal? And so those are policy decisions, you know, um, push back, push for Medicaid expansion, you know, um, eliminate work requirements that are impeding people from being able to access programs like Medicaid, push for the social determinants of health, things like housing. We are in the middle of a housing crisis that was already existing before COVID-19 and has now been smashed even more wide open. People are being evicted. People are suffering. Whatever short term changes on the local state and national level that we can that, that we can um, leverage now to address immediate suffering, those things matter, right? Um, because that suffering matters. But I think longer term, that's when we think towards uh, towards kind of feedback effects. What can we do now that will feed into a future that looks like more people having power and voice who don't now so that we can get to the big fundamental changes so that we can get to a point where discussing something like reparations doesn't feel like pie in the sky as far as the political reality of it. It doesn't have to be that way, right? Um, it is that way uh, because we accept it as such. And so that's when we can think about how do you change the, the terms of, of the game? How do you change the rules of the game? How do you change the way people are thinking, the kind of socialization? Some of that happens through social movements, right? Um, some of that happens through organizing and, and mobilizing, which is part and parcel of social movements. And sometimes, it, you know, you change the policies first and then you change the perspectives, right? Um, you know, the, the, not that this is where our hope lies at this point, but the Supreme Court made a decision uh, you know, in Loving versus Virginia in 67, that that interracial marriage was constitutional at a time when the vast majority of Americans did not believe that. Right. The policy or change followed people's changes in hearts and minds followed the changes in policy. And so we need a balance. We can't wait until hearts and minds change to, to believe in transformative possibilities. We, we need the force of power. Um, to change things, whether or not the folks um, who are going to potentially lose resources and power are on board. But I think as that happens, hopefully people can start to see what, what Professor Rich pointed out, which is that we're all better off when we're all better off, right? We're, we, we're all living in a society that is richer in the ways that matter um, and fuller and more democratic in the ways that matter when we are all part of that polity and when we all have um, our human dignity being respected, our material well-being being ensured. Um, but I think there will there are many people who will not believe that until it happens. And so those people have to be skipped over, and we have to in, empower and 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 build power among the folks that understand the kinds of changes that have to be made. But that's long term. In the short term, there's so much suffering right now. We just need to plug as much of that as possible. That's a uh... I, that's incredibly helpful for me to think about it too. I think, like John said, it can become an overwhelming thing to think about in your mind, but the way you lay it out is really beautiful. Um, Courtney, you, we're, we're over time, but I just any last thoughts from you? You, you know, you spoke really beautifully about reparations. Are there any other policies you think that are important to think about right now uh, before we wrap up? I'm just going to echo um, what Professor Meechner just said in that I think we can use this particular political moment. Um, as an opportunity to lay the groundwork for a future in which um, racial equity and undoing the harms of white supremacy becomes part and parcel for policy work, right? So using the Black Lives Matter movement and the movements against police violence as a way to reimagine what community policing could look like, what community safety looks like in the long term. 
um, using the pandemic and the harms and terrible bereavement that we've all collectively experienced, but as that is particularly burdened and felt on the shoulders of families of color in the United States, using those moments to think about how we can ensure economic safety and pop in up health security in this particular moment, stopping evictions, giving folks economic relief um, without tremendous administrative burden, how we can take advantage of some of the particularities of this historical and political moment to lay the groundwork for a future in which, um, you know, equity is more central. And, you know, I just want to also reiterate that I think this is not just something I think about with the new administration, right? I don't have these tremendous hopes that everything is going to change in November or with the turn of any administration, but this is really a commitment that I think grassroots organizations and, and residents need to make um, to make this happen. Yeah, I, thank you all so much for, for having this conversation with us. Um, it was eye-opening and inspiring even in these really challenging times. Um, so once again, Professor Jacoby, Professor Rich, Professor Bohm, Professor Missioner, your perspectives are so valuable and we appreciate your time. Thanks. I would like to echo the thanks from Athene to all of you guys. What a tremendous uh, opportunity to hear from you and learn from all of you. And thank you everyone in the audience for joining us. I hope that you'll join us again for future events. Thanks everyone.